Okay, we, we are starting. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Good morning, Margaret. Good morning, uh, if you are, good day. That's the, the best way to, to do it. Uh, we are all coming from all over the world. And this is uh, the first meeting of the webinar series uh, on trust and regulatory governance in an age of uh, crisis. Um, the, the keynote, the first, uh, the opening uh, with us today is Professor Margaret Levy uh, from uh, Stanford, Stanford University. I will present her properly in, in a minute. I will just say that uh, the seminar uh, is organized by um, uh, the Tigre project, uh, EU 2020 project uh, on trust and regulation in, um, in governance. And uh, this is the first um, uh, meeting and we will have about 10, at least 10 meetings in the coming months. Uh, program uh, will be available via the network and they also provide the, 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 the remaining um, and the subscription to the, our mailing list in the chat box. My name is David Levy Farour and I'm here uh, on behalf of my friends. Next week, the same time, um, I, no, not the same times, but uh, much earlier is the uh, another uh, presentation by Cohen Ferus on trust and vaccination. But today we are lucky, we are lucky and grateful to have Margaret uh, with us. Margaret Levy is um, Sarah Miller McCune Director of the Center for Advanced Studies in um, Stanford University. It's one of the centers for advanced studies, uh, this kind of wonderful place where you can do research for, for a year or more, or a semester, um, a place that uh, I, I think most of us would love to, to have the chance to be. She's also a professor at the political science department at Stanford, Stanford University. And she is the 2019 recipient of John Skite Prize. She was the head of the American Political Science Association. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Art of Sciences, but also of the American Academy uh, of Political uh, um, and Social Sciences, the American Philosophers, Philosophical Society, the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, she was a John Simon Gaginai Fellow, and uh, most of all, uh, she is um, she's, um, one of the, the leaders of the community of political science and comparative political science uh, uh, more generally, uh, one of the leading scholars uh, around, and we are privileged to have you with us to talk uh, about trustworthy government and legitimating belief. Thank you very much, Margaret. It's an honor to have you with us. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, David, for all the work you've done on trust and trustworthiness and in supporting this uh, whole effort at thinking about these issues. I'm going to share my screen now, I hope. Always um, an iffy question whether it shares. OK. There we go. Gentlemen. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking, I mean, this is a very interesting time to be talking about trustworthy government and legitimacy. Um, there are some real questions about whether legitimacy is actually in peril. These are slides uh, mostly from the last four years. It's hard to find a slide of voting fraud because um, there doesn't really seem to be any and it's not a public act, but clearly the whole discussion of uh, the US election and whether or not there has been fraud has uh, raised some real questions about confidence in government and confidence in our system. This was the demonstration by women right after the Trump inauguration. I'm just gonna give you some examples here, some visual examples of where questions of trust, trustworthiness and legitimacy come up. Black Lives Matter. And on the other side, we have uh, you know, white extremists of various kinds 
uh, this was in Charlottesville, who are raising other kinds of questions about their beliefs in confidence in government and its legitimacy. All of you, I'm sure, are familiar. I'm just going to run through these because all of you are familiar with these multiple surveys that have been done in the US and elsewhere about how trust in government measured by um, whether the federal government does what is right just about always or most of the time. And we're seeing how this has been in decline um, since 1958, the year when these kinds of surveys started being taken in the US. This is just another version of that. Um, the Pew survey people have said the public trust in the federal government um, is near historic lows for more than a decade. Can everybody mute? Somebody, I'm hearing somebody's voice in here. Thanks. David, you could mute. Who's ever not muted? Um, this is a this is a graph that uh, shows that trust in government has evaporated or has declined in many, many countries. And this is a graph showing you that the same thing is true for the media. Okay, so I'm gonna build on my work and ask, I'm not actually, um, as some of you may know, a great fan of the surveys. I showed them because they're sort of an indicator but I don't think they're a totally sufficient indicator of some of the concepts that I wanna talk about. Um, and so we have to delve a little deeper. And here's some of the single authored or uh, monographs that I've done. I know that on the back of his screen, David has a book I did with Valerie, an edited book that I did with Valerie Braithwaite. You can sort of see a corner of it in his screen. But the work I'm really drawing on is from these books and from an important uh, collaboration that I've had over several articles, particularly with Audrey Sachs, uh, but also with Tom Tyler. And out of that work, um, all of this work really, we came up, uh, this is from an article that Tom and Audrey and I did. Um, we came up with the notion of a virtuous circle of governance and it raises, I'm gonna come back to this circle later in the talk, but it raises some very important um, questions about uh, and sort of visually shows how we think about both trustworthiness and legitimacy. The first set of the boxes, administrative competence, government performance, the circle the oval government effectiveness and the rectangle procedural justice are all ways in which trustworthiness is thought about and measured, whether government is really trustworthy and therefore uh, deserves in some sense our trust. And those things are part of what then helps to build, but they're not all that helps to build what we call value-based legitimacy or legitimating beliefs. Um, the belief that government is in fact legitimate. And what really becomes important here for my story at least is behavioral-based legitimacy, compliance and non-compliance with a variety of directives from government. And if it's positive, if there is a lot of compliance or acceptance and willing behavior, then we see a positive feedback loop to government trustworthiness, which helps then to build um, the value-based legitimacy and the ultimate compliance. So the questions I'm gonna address are what creates the circle, what breaks the circle or prevents it being created in the first place, and how do we build or reestablish a virtuous circle? David, I can't see a clock. So could you do me a favor and give me a sort of, you know, five minutes to go sign when I get to that point? Thanks. Okay, so what my work suggests on these questions, there's some, um, as, I, as I've emphasized in describing the virtuous circle, the crucial things here are beliefs and behavior. Those are really, really my key concepts. And I'm just listing here in black are, on all of these are concepts that I have uh, developed or discussed in some of my work. And the three that are in red, trustworthy government, legitimating beliefs, and moral political economy are ones that I will particularly address today. 
particularly the first two of those. Though I would argue that all of these things play a role in creating both trustworthy government and legitimating beliefs. I'm gonna give you some stories here to just uh, animate the then the, the more, um, the concepts that I will be developing. Uh, this is from this is from the book Consent, Dissent, and Patriotism, and part of what I looked at there was the conscription controversy in a variety of locations, but among them were was Australia. And in 1919, there was a referenda, uh, a literal referenda, as well as a vote about a prime minister about conscription, and these were the pro-conscription uh, posters. Um, really appealing to a national sentiment uh, about how this war is legitimate and how uh, important it was to serve. And you can see that there is an emphasis here as well on women. This was, women were able to vote and voted in this, on this referenda. This is 1919, um, actually 1917, sorry, at the beginning of the war. Um, and were able to vote on this, uh, this referendum and on the government. The Australian anti-conscription campaign really made it clear that they thought the war was illegitimate and that government couldn't be trusted to protect the young men, that there would be very differential treatment of uh, the Irish of the working class uh, members. So it really became a class vote. It was in fact, uh, conscription was in fact defeated um, in this particular referendum, but it came back uh, when the prime minister was reelected and managed to introduce it. This is the con Canadian conscription vote in 1943. And you can see that there is a huge divide here. Basically what you're seeing is the Francophone uh, provinces, which are in orange, are voting against conscription, and the Anglophone provinces are voting for conscription. It was a real language and religious split, but what was really interesting about this case is that the British, the Francophones, believed the war was legitimate, and they also had confidence that governments, that once they went to war, they would be treated fairly. The Francophones, on the other hand, had a history of feeling strongly discriminated against by the federal government. They were worried that the military would use only English and the French soldier, the French speaking soldiers would not even know when they were told to retreat or to move, do something different. But equally importantly, they really believed the war was illegitimate because the, 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 the concord that created Canada between the Francophones and the Anglophones said that um, Canada would never conscript unless Canada was under attack. They were not persuaded by arguments that because France was under attack, Canada was under attack. The Anglophones, on the other hand, seemed to believe they were still very much part of Britain. So there was a real difference in their legitimating beliefs. Now, sometimes people misperceive what is going on. And this, I'm just showing you this as an example of a misperception um, and a way that can affect trust in government or the trustworthiness of government as it's perceived and can affect even legitimating beliefs. So in the US since the early 1990s, I, this only goes up to 2015, there's some question about uh, what the events of the summer, but trends in violent crime and property crime have gone down uh, pretty significantly in most places. And yet most people, a lot of people in the United States seem to believe that they have to, they have to worry about law and order and that government isn't, isn't capably and the police aren't capably protecting them. So the public perception of crime rate is at significant odds with reality. And I'm bringing that in here now because I really wanna emphasize that citizen perceptions um, as well as their beliefs 
as about legitimacy as well as really affect uh, their confidence and perception of what government is doing for them. Okay, so what I want to argue is that the trust of trust of government is really the result of an interaction between citizens and governments about something in particular. You have confidence in the government to protect you um, against foreign enemies, against domestic uh, criminals, uh, that you believe that it's building infrastructure or not. Um, and so you have confidence in particular things, not a generalized trust of government. And government trustworthiness is often multidimensional, therefore it can be trustworthy in some regards and not in others, objectively trustworthy and differentially perceived as trustworthy in various dimensions. And citizen perceptions, as I've just shown you, can be affected by other things than reality. But one of the things I'm going to emphasize here is that for me, behavioral measures, like whether people are complying with the law, whether they're um, willingly uh, volunteering with military service, whether they're willingly paying taxes to the extent we can measure that, are often better than surveys and certainly are an important an additional and necessary supplement to surveys. So I really am encouraging more research and more effort to get at behavioral measures. And there's been some real progress on that in the last couple of years. So when we talk about trust of government, what are we really talking about? And I would argue that it, de it depends on two things. The first is on actual government behavior. Is it in fact, is government in fact trustworthy? And I emphasize trustworthy here and the trustworthiness of government more than the, than the trust in government. This is trustworthiness is in, is in principle objective. There are institutional and accountability arrangements that we can look at and that give us credible assurances that government will deliver what it promises, will inhibit free riding and has the capacity to do that, that government is fair and not discriminatory. That is, is it treating folks the same or differently? Another aspect of trustworthiness, which seems to have been lost from this slide is competence to do those things. So uh, one is that there are actual accountability arrangements in place, but also reasons to, to uh, credit that government can actually deliver, inhibit, and be fair. But of course, trust of government um, and depends on as well on citizen perceptions. So we have lots of examples where government is in fact very trustworthy. I will use another American example there's very little, well, I'll use the election as an example. There's very little evidence that there is any kind of widespread voter fraud in the United States ever. I mean, at least in the last decades, there was once quite significant amount, but certainly in the last decades. But the citizen perception, I read a study uh, yesterday that nearly 70% of re Republicans do not believe that government is trustworthy in this regard, that the elections have actually been fair and believe that there has been voter fraud. So even though there's objective trustworthiness of the electoral system, citizen perceptions are at odds with that. So what changes citizen perceptions? Well, a major part of the story I think is beliefs about how the world works, beliefs about gov what government should do um, this is the argument about the moral political economy. Um, so Thatcher and Reagan uh, really created a huge shift in attitudes, not only in the US and Britain, but in many other countries that adopted the neoliberal framework about what government should actually be doing. So ideology and values that underlie the framework of what of government's responsibilities and obligations do change. Um, and as I've said several times now, that's often disconnected from what's really happening. So I should go back to beliefs about how the world works and explain what that means a little more. 
So one of the things that I learned in writing a book with John Alquist called In the Interest of Others, we studied a series of unions as a way of looking at as it were many governments. And one of the things that was very important there in creating not just legitimacy of what the union was doing and its choices, and not only trust in the and confidence in the leadership of the union, but what also created um, a, a belief that that a, that or or a commitment to actions um, in the interest of others who can never reciprocate what John and I call an expanded community of faith. What caused that was a partially a change in beliefs about how the world works enabling people to engage in a deliberative process of learning about the world, who was suffering and why, um, and, and coming to really find that credible because they debated with each other, used different kinds of materials and argued about it until they were confident enough to vote one way or another about to, how to engage in costly actions on behalf of very distant others. Um, and that's a real change in citizen perceptions. And I think a lesson for making the media and our government much more trustworthy is that kind of process of creating uh, new kinds of beliefs about how the world works. Okay, um, so important nuances I should just raise to make sure they're out there. No one and no government is trustworthy to everyone on every dimension. We wouldn't expect that. In fact, I'd be a little nervous if everybody was sort of in lockstep or mindset step uh, about what government was doing. It's healthy to have skepticism about government or parts of government. And we always want that kind of debate to go on. And frankly, objectively, it's not possible because the world does change um, and government does not always keep up with the world as it's changing, as we've seen in the instance of American policing. We should make a clear distinction between government and politicians and often these surveys, not all of them, but uh, certainly in the past, many of them, sort of conflated the two. So if you were asked if you trusted government, you were usually thinking about a particular president or head of government, rather than thinking about government agencies. The questions, as we know, have uh, improved over time to ask about specific attributes or agencies of government. But we have seen a general decline in pop popularity of politicians, both in general and as an, and as an honorable pursuit. Um, and frankly, citizens have no or very little long-term memory and so can't remember what was uh, unions or another case of this where uh, unions have become sort of um, in bad odor among much of the American population, including working class people, they can't really remember. Um, and it's not in their experience about what unions or governments have created for them. I live in the state of Washington, which has a divide between the West, uh, west of the mountains where Seattle is and where all the democratic votes generally are or a large proportion of them are. And the East of the mountains, which tends to be very anti-government. And yet it is built on and depends on large dams that were built by the federal government and maintains that infrastructure. Otherwise it's a desert and it wouldn't be the fruit basket of the United States and the wine basket, one of the wine baskets of the United States that it is. You see, I forgot to fix this slide up. Okay, so I've talked about trustworthy government now let me turn to the question of legitimacy and I'm gonna call on two uh, venerable Germans as it turns out, um, Max Weber and Fritz Scharpe. Um, Max Weber of course gave us uh, in many ways the concept of legitimacy and Fritz Scharpe is really responsible for the notion of performance-based legitimacy. And I wanna address a number of questions that they both raise. 
So I, I'm just refreshing your mind here about the um, virtuous circle of governance. This is the study that Audrey, this is from the study that Audrey Sachs and I did um, using uh, data from uh, the Afrobarometer survey, which also included behavioral data um, it, and, and structural data. It showed us uh, where various police stations, hospitals, health centers, et cetera, roads existed. Um, as well as had some information about uh, what people were actually doing in those areas. So it combined the survey data with some uh, other kinds of data, which I think make it, make it particularly strong. Um, and you can see that there, this is a, this lets us know something about what increases um, legitimating beliefs in terms of people being willing to pay taxes. Overall perceptions of government um, clearly raise that, governments meeting the fiscal contract, all of these are positive until you get to food security, which is right on the line. This is another, this is from um, some work uh, by Blinkhofer and his uh, colleagues. And these, this is all Iraqi provinces. And I'm showing this as a counter example in a way, because what this data showed, which was um, largely a survey, but it showed that it's sort of a U-shaped curve, at least in these regions, about the satisfaction with government performance of services um, and the willingness to pay for improvements, on, uh, another kind of, uh, behavioral measure, but this is obviously done in a survey. So it's a legitimating uh, belief uh, that takes the form of willingness to pay. So they don't quite understand why it went this way, um, but I think that's an interesting example that we should think about. Okay, what is a legitimate government? Well, I wanna emphasize that it's different it has a different set of attributes than trustworthiness, uh, though it may or may not build on trustworthiness, probably does. It appeals to, when we talk about legitimacy, we're talking about widely accepted justifications for the selection and maintenance of government. And we're talking about upholding values around which there is considerable consensus. We're talking about shared values. Those don't have to be in trustworthiness. Trustworthiness has to do with competence and with accountability, um, with performance to some extent. So um, it may or may not require a trustworthy government to be legitimate. I can think of legitimate governments that appear to be legitimate, theocracies of particularly of the past, even some of the present, some forms of autocracy. Um, that were considered or maybe still considered legitimate. But I suspect a trustworthy government is a condition for a legitimate democratic government. I can't see the two of those being totally separated in a democratic setting. And a trustworthy government and a legitimate government needs and feeds what I'm calling a moral political economy. Every political economy is a moral political economy. Everyone has values. I'm part of a large project um, based in Casbis that's trying to help generate a new moral politically economic framework that will overtake the neoliberal one, which is clearly fraying. Um, so to build a moral political economy, we need a trustworthy government, certainly to sustain a moral political economy. And we need the perception that it is a legitimate both framework and government. So this means that the reciprocal obligations among citizens, governments, firms, workers, NGOs, religious institutions, et cetera, are recognized and shared. So where does compliance come back into all of this? Um, what, I, what I'm arguing here and um, argued in a paper that I did uh, last year in NOMOS um, 
If an individual believes government is untrustworthy and illegitimate, she will comply only if coerced. If an individual believes government is trustworthy, she will comply if she believes government will ensure others will comply if it can solve the free rider problem sufficiently. As um, otherwise, why would you comply even if you think it's trustworthy? If an individual believes government is trustworthy and legitimate, she will comply without coercion and without assurance of others complying. And that's what we sort of want to achieve, though we don't want, we do want um, free riding to be reined in. We don't want anybody to be a sucker in this case. But the big question is how do we tell when compliance is for one reason or another? And what I did in that NOMOS paper and what I've only achieved so far is raising that question rather than answering it. So let me conclude. I think I'm well in time, so we have lots of time for discussion. Trustworthy uh, so government. Yeah. Well, I'm no, going to. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm close to the end, and I'd rather um, engage in conversation and discussion. Um, trustworthiness of government is contingent on the amount, quality, and fairness of goods and services supplied. So, performance. But I think that's as much about trustworthiness as about legitimacy or more so, expectations that people have of government and its accountability and its competence. Um, legitimacy is fragile. Trustworthiness is perhaps necessary, but not always a sufficient condition. What's really crucial is shared values, which are regularly reaffirmed and reestablished. This is not a static problem. To create and sustain legitimacy requires lots of work. And there are multiple forms and sources of breakdown. Um, regimes can uh, fall. So leaders can be a problem as several of our countries recognize in terms of undermining legitimacy of various agencies as well as trustworthiness, their, tr their actual trustworthiness and the trust in them and divisions in population. Um, the Civil War in the United States is clearly a case of the breakdown in legitimacy among populations, but there are many throughout history. And I would argue finally that both trustworthiness and legitimacy is most like, likely in an accepted moral and shared understanding of a moral political economy. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, and would love your feedback and questions. Thank you very much, um, Margaret. I will give you um, a few minutes to read the, the chat uh, comments there. And while you are reading and um, maybe taking some of the questions or asking uh, some of the of the people to 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 go uh, and to introduce themselves and question in uh, on. Um, you know, uh, in person. So we have Martino, we have Hanan, we have uh, Hillary, we have Marcus there. Um, and also we have the, the crisis, the crisis of political um, or, or liberal democracies and, and the crisis, the corona, the virus uh, crisis. Um, and we, I'd love to connect them um, as well, but I will let, let you do the, 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 the decision about that. And I will ask uh, Martino to go on and uh, ask his question, the one that he raises, raised in text. Martino, do you want to, to go? Yes, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your um, presentation. It's very inspiring. Um, so my, my question is about um, the, the conceptualization of trustworthiness that you put forward. I, I think it's, um, yeah, it's extremely interesting. Um, so my, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to, to think about the, the implications uh, of uh, this distinction you made between the, the, so the two side uh, uh, um, uh, 
conceptualization uh, about the objective trustworthiness on one side and the perceived trustworthiness uh, of government. So um, um, it, it looks like uh, one of the implication is that what should matter for from a democratic theory perspective, I would say, is not or is mostly not the decline in trust in government per se, because it might correspond to a decline in trustworthiness. So if there is less objective trustworthiness, it's, I mean, I would say fine, so, or that, that there is less trust in, govern, in, in government. But uh, what is more worrying would be the widening of the discrepancy between the objective trustworthiness and the uh, uh, citizen perception of trustworthy, trustworthiness. That's what, that would be the, the prob a problem, of course, the widening of this gap, more than the big issue we are talking about all the time, the decline of trust in government. The, uh, so the question is simply if, if, it, if it makes sense. And uh, uh, a related question would be, uh, so I understand that objective trustworthiness is in particular about expectation and expectations about promises to be fulfilled, uh, plus some criteria with respect to integrity and uh, so on and so forth. So is that a way to determine objective trustworthiness about whether what has, um, has been promised is delivered by, by the government? So uh, there are several, that, that was a very interesting question, but it was multiple questions. So let me, let me try to uh, parse it out a little bit. So uh, it, the first part of your question, yes, I think the really big issue is the dispa disparity between the actual objective trustworthiness of government and citizens' perceptions of that. And there's um, lots of evidence and ex examples of that happening over history where there's a real you know, one thing is the government's done a very good job if or an agency has done a very good job of actually making itself objectively trustworthy, but citizens don't perceive it that way. And what what is particularly worrying, I think, in the particular era, and it's, this has happened in the past as well, but we live now, is the ways in which certain government actors, like presidents and prime ministers, are actually um, fueling a false disparity where they're, they're making people believe something that isn't true about government. So that, yes, that is a deep concern um, in, in terms of that. The second part of your, and I think that's an, you know, that's how we, we've got to start looking at that more. So the, 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 that's where I'm not so happy with the surveys because they're useful if we then put them in, in, in connection with certain features of government and then start trying to tease out why those disparities are occurring or why the confluence occurs. And it can happen the other way too. I mean, people can have confidence in certain government agencies that they shouldn't. Um, so we've also got to look at it from that direction. Then the second part of your question, you might have to repeat that. Um, yeah, sorry. Just it was it was just about uh, um, you know the, the the way to assess uh, or, or to operationalize this objective uh, trustworthiness. I, I think that a part of the uh, a part of uh, uh, the way you you can operationalize it is about the extent to which what is promised is actually delivered. Uh, 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 is this correct? But then there are other criteria, like uh, I don't know the integrity uh, uh, of government. And... Well, there's also something I didn't emphasize adequately in this particular presentation. So this gives me a chance to raise it. Don't th thank you for that, Martino. I'm looking at what where I, your where your picture is in my screen, so I don't know what I'm actually looking at. Um, is that there? It's not just performance. It's also procedural justice, however it's defined in that particular period. So a government could be delivering what it's promised, but it's only certain people are getting it. Um, or it's only promising to certain people when it should be something universal or 
given to a, a whole category and it's only given to part of that category. So I think that uh, procedural justice is equally important with performance in, as a measure of objective trustworthiness. And I also think there's a third piece of it, which I did emphasize, but again, let me re-emphasize, which is if, if um, you can't solve the free rider problem about whatever it is that you're asking compliance about, whether it be the law, be it taxes, be it conscription, be it whatever it is, um, then people are gonna lose confidence in government around that or around that agency on that dimension as well. Because it's really important to feel that, not that you're being punished, that the government's gonna punish you, but that the government's gonna be able to note who, else, who is not complying when you're giving your money or giving your life um, and make sure that they do their part as well. Thank you, Margaret. Ijik, please. Sure. Hi again, Margaret. So it's- uh, Hi, Ishik. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this great talk. And uh, I have a question on the attributes of trustworthiness. So you said, um, the government delivers, um, so the amount, quality, and uh, fairness of goods and services uh, supplied, and expectations and accountability, right? So, and I was wondering if all these uh, three uh, attributes necessary um, necessary for the tra trustworthiness, and that is to say, for instance, if the uh, if the government is not accountable. But if it delivers um, generously, and would that, uh, I mean, would the trustworthiness of the government um, be hazarded uh, by that? And, um, or let's say the generosity of, uh, of the provision uh, can uh, compensate for accountability. Thank you. That, that's a great question. And it makes me realize, um, some of the scope conditions here for what I'm saying. Um, I think that trustworthy government anywhere requires the three things that I said to Martino about uh, performance, about uh, procedural justice by whatever the standards are of the day and of the place. Mm -hmm. So it's quite variable obviously um, across place and time. And the third being the capacity of government to, uh, to, to locate and punish free riders. I think those three things are necessarily necessary for trustworthiness everywhere. Those three things I said at the end, um, and I should have added procedural justice in there as well, are the really the important conditions for democratic trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure all, I think governments often have proven themselves to be trustworthy that aren't democratic and aren't held accountable because they provide the bread and circuses. They provide mm -hmm. the goods um, that they have promised, but they aren't necessarily held accountable in any way. So I think it, I think it was a good question. It's about, I think there's a scope condition here uh, for democracies that really is about accountability. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'd like to invite, um... Uh, Jonathan and Oliver and Libby, uh, but please uh, do it, uh, you know, try to, to make it short. So we... Yeah, we... Thank you, um, David. I think we all have questions on this theme of uh, objective trustworthiness. Uh, mine was about uh, accountability. Uh, since academics can't agree amongst themselves about what the criteria for adequate accountability are there lots of different models citizens can't uh, either and so um, e even if there may be an objective dimension to whether accountability is adequate doesn't it uh, depend on the criteria which are subjective and which uh, may be contested and you said something pretty similar about procedural justice that those standards can vary. Um, right. One could even ask about performance. So the question is, um, how far can uh, an attempt really to ground the objective 
trustworthiness of, uh, of government take us in the face of disagreement about the criteria? I guess I don't think there's as much contestation. I think they change, the, the conceptions of those things change, but I don't think there's as much contestation as you're suggesting. I mean, I think there are norms and ideas about procedural justice that dominate in a variety of places and times. I think that's the same thing with accountability. We have certain kinds of ideas about what it makes means to make an agency or a government accountable. That doesn't mean there aren't tweaking and flexibility and change. So I don't think we want a, a measure that is totally static um, in terms of saying that this is always the criteria, but we're always looking for what, what is the standard of accountability in that particular place and time? What is the standard of procedural justice in that place and time? What is the standard of performance in that place and time? And I think we can do that. And I think I, I to some extent, have done that in some of my work. Um, but I, you know, I, it's worth trying. If I could just come back very, very briefly. Sure. Um, you know, if we look in transnational settings, the European Union, uh, transnational and global governance, uh, there is more uh, contestation over uh, what are adequate models of accountability. And standard models which are taken from the nation state don't fit very well, and they're indeed part of the, uh, the problem. So I, I think it's worth considering when you bring different frames together, whether that doesn't cause uh, you know, more difficulty for, for the idea of a you know, a, a historically set at any given time, uh, adequate set of criteria. Very interesting point. I mean, I really don't think very much I have to say about international government arrangements. And that's, that's very interesting, Jonathan. I will keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Oliver, please. Thank you. Um, so I had a question about the necessary conditions for the development of trust. And I wondered whether one of the necessary conditions is a shared sense, if you like, of the nature of uh, the reality of performance, whether performance is actually good or bad, and also the nature of uh, the policy problems and potential solutions. Because one of the things that's sort of defining the current um, sort of political climate in many uh, contexts is uh, politically motivated reasoning about performance so that people don't agree on the facts, the objective facts, uh, and misinformation such that you know, it's, it's difficult to get a consensus really on, on, on how things are going, on what policy problems are realistic and so on. And that these, these, um, these, these sort of sense, this is a sense of a shared reality in a, in a political community is something that would be necessary for, for trust, but is particularly difficult to establish at the moment with such polarization in, uh, in media and information environments in particular. Well, that was part of, I, I, Oliver, I totally agree. And I think that is part of what I was trying to show with those crime statistics that people can really misunderstand the reality in which they're in. And so beliefs about the world have a very, and how the world is actually operating have a very important uh, influence on citizens' perceptions and thus lead to that increasing disparity between trustworthiness of government objectively defined, if we can objectively define it. I've got Jonathan over here doubting that. Um, but if we can objectively define it, it that, that kind exactly what you're talking about is leading to that disparity between what government is actually providing and doing and how citizens perceive it to be behaving. And that's a big problem that we have to address. Well, I suppose that was really the, 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 the question I had really was that given the entrenched political reasoning, I mean, isn't it a necessary feature that that shared conception of reality exists? And also how, how can we go about establishing that given the, the polarization about even matters of fact well, I'm, a, I'm an, an optimist. We've seen the world do this before. Various parts of our worlds do this before, um, have this kind of split and polarization, and we will never have totally shared values. I mean, that's 
you know, there are going to be lots of disagreements on various things. I can't uh, imagine, for example, in the United States that there will ever be a totally shared value on abortion, at least not in the foreseeable future, as, as an example. That's not, that, that's a different kind of value than the one you're talking about, different kind of reality than the one you're talking about, but still an indicator of the kind of polarization. But I do think that if we can in fact build a new moral political economic framework, um, that it is possible to, that's built around some common values and there are lots of common values in the United States and in many other polarized communities, Canada, others, Israel, um, that we could really rebuild based on those common values and really build a better structure. I mean, I think we all feel that we should be given equal consideration politically. We all uh, want uh, certain kinds of uh, liberties and rights. So I think there's a bunch of things we can build on, but we need to really build that framework. And that's what I've been spending a lot of my time on. And it's not an easy problem, but it's one we, and a lot of other people are working on the you know, related issues. So I think that's the um, million dollar, six trillion dollar question, trillion, trillion, trillion dollar question right now um, is how to really build that framework so that we can reestablish some basis for a conversation and disagreement that is the right kind of disagreement. I mean, we want to disagree, we are going to disagree on policies and programs and practices, and that's healthy because we aren't all gonna be alike, but we need to create a framework that allows that to happen without it dividing us, but allows us, to, and that's why I talked about the community of fate. One of the things that those unions were able to really create was that kind of, they already had some solidarity around being workers and being in a union that was fighting strikes, but they had really serious political disagreements and disagreements about how the world was working um, and yet a set of institutional arrangements enabled them to not only have a good conversation about that, but to agree to act in the interest of far distant others. So I'm optimistic it can be built. And I, I can give you other examples where I've seen things break down and be rebuilt through a series of processes of really creating a new national or international or whatever it is conversation. Yanis, uh, Yanis, uh, do you want to follow up? And afterwards, uh, we had Maria, Teresa, uh, Hilary, and maybe Hanan. So Yanis, please. Follow yes, thank up. you. Thank you very much, uh, David. Thank you also very much, Professor Levy, for this great talk. I would like to follow up on the relationship between accountability and trust. I am not sure that the relationship is a linear one. Um, I think we can hypothesize that um, um, to, 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 to generate trust, uh, maybe it's not adequate to, to maximize accountability because, um, you know, it's the whole issue about the audit society. The, the more accountability you have, the more this is likely to, to, to fuel a culture of uh, suspicion and uh, generate distrust. So I think the issue is more about optimizing accountability and of course this is it's difficult to uh, to know how much accountability we need to to, to generate trust this is the, the first part of my question uh, in which accountability seems at least according to you to be the independent variable that uh, explains how much trust we have now i think uh, um w the, w we may have a rever reverse relationship in which uh, trust is the independent variable and uh, accountability the dependent one because well if i trust well of course i may trust government because i see that there are appropriate accountability ch the channels but uh, i can also uh, if i trust government i i'm i may also th reasonably think that it's not necessary for me to hold it accountable to control it precisely because I trust it. So if I can have your views on that, it would be great. Thank you. Okay, I, do, I had to write because it got to be very complicated. 
Um, okay, so thank you for that. Um, obviously, I'm going to have to, uh, between yours and Jonathan's questions, I'm going to have to think a little harder about how I, and, and Ishik's, I'm going to have to think a little bit harder about how I use the term accountability um, and what role it plays. I don't see it as, an in, as the independent variable that accounts for trust or even trustworthiness of government. It's one of the variables. Um, the, I really think that trustworthiness is built on this combination of things. And, so that, and trust in government is based in part on those if people are looking objectively at what's going on, but it's also as we've just been talking about and as Oliver's question and as Martino's question raised, is really um, dependent on a whole bunch of other variables that really have nothing to do or very little to do with what government is actually doing. Um, so accountability plays a role in there, but it's not as strong a role as you're saying. I certainly could agree, I certainly do agree that it's not necessarily linear. Um, and then I'm not sure I argued that it was, but maybe that's the implication of what I said. So I will think harder about uh, how, to, how to work through that concept. Um, the last part of your question was that, that trust in government might actually create accountability. Is that right? Is, am I getting that right? No, that if it's not, it's not exactly that. If we trust government, maybe we feel that we don't need to hold government accountable. Ah, okay. Um, that may be true, but I would also, I would argue that that is a problematic perception. That we actually, if government is trust, objectively trustworthy, it should be accountable. That is part of what it means to be a trustworthy government or agency. It worries me if citizens don't care if it's accountable. Yes, they could trust it. Uh, we see lots of examples of citizens trusting presidents and prime ministers who are not who are trying to, you know, remove themselves from accountability. And I think that's very problematic in at least in a democratic polity where accountability is one of our values. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, we have Marie, we have Maria, Teresa, Hilary, uh, and then Ijik uh, again, if we can. Uh, please, Maria. Good evening. Thank you very much, Margaret, for your very interesting talk. Um, I truly enjoy the conceptual breadth of your of your framework of, of virtuous uh, governance. And it is really challenging to, to truly follow up on that. I'm, I'm a lawyer, um, so perhaps I have a bit of a different take on the concepts that you're using. Um, my question is, what exactly is the conceptual relationship between trustworthiness and legitimacy? Because you have been talking about both and you often have been using them both in tandem. And so you do say that trustworthiness is a precondition for legitimacy, which makes a lot of sense. But I wonder how exactly do you make it, uh, how exactly do you see the influence of trust um, on legitimacy? So in other words, uh, how does it contribute to creating legitimating beliefs? Um, so in a democracy, I usually would understand legitimacy and legitimating belief as being uh, what we can expect that, that they would be formed if there is a democratic process in place and if we take output legitimacy, if, if there is good outcome that the government is producing. So where does trust come in here in, in reinforcing those legitimating beliefs about process and output? And perhaps as a secondary question, how would you measure trust and its influence on legitimacy. Okay, so um, the virtuous circle of government governance diagram tries to show that relationship. Um, so what you're seeing is that certain fat features of government that make it trustworthy, which are partially performance, but also procedural justice, um, as well as 
some form of accountability and a competence, we shouldn't forget competence here, then enable people to believe that government is legitimate. So there, that's in that paper that I did with uh, Tom Tyler and with Audrey Sachs. And what we were arguing there the, was that the nature of government performance, competence, um, justice, made people feel more favorably to government and feel like it actually represented their values, their shared values with others about what government was supposed to be doing for them. So it has to do with a notion of um, not just that government is performing, therefore I think it's legitimate, but because you have certain kinds of expectations about what government is supposed to be providing you and what its obligations to you are. There's a kind of contract as it were. And if it's not being fulfilled, you doubt its trustworthiness, but you also doubt its legitimacy because it's not acting according to values that have been established as part of what that society is supposed to be providing you and you in turn therefore providing to it. So those legitimating beliefs really come from that set of values that are then um, that are then supported. Your belief that those values are actually being acted on by the government are supported by the government being trustworthy. So that's in part the relationship between trustworthiness of government and legitimacy of government is right in there. Now. As I said, in democracy, it's probably unlikely that a government will be considered legitimate if, if, if it's most of it, if it's important agencies are not acting in ways that people perceive as trustworthy, um, if they don't have confidence in them. I guess it could happen. And there certainly could be legitimacy of particular politicians, even if they, you know, because they're charismatic or because They've made promises people misbelieve that and believe were happening, the reality problem that Oliver was addressing. Um, so there can be a mismatch between legitimacy and trustworthiness. But on the whole, I would say in a democratic polity, trustworthiness probably is a precondition for legitim legitimacy of government, that those things are intertwined in that way. But ultimately, legitimacy has to do with shared values. How do I measure it? How do I measure legitimacy? I've never been able to figure out how to measure legitimacy, which is why I looked at trustworthiness and looked at compliance. Um, so, I mean, I think legitimacy, I, for a long time, when I wrote Of Rule and Revenue now 30 some years ago, um, people said, oh, this is a book about legitimacy, a word I never used in that book, not once. I avoided the word. I consciously avoided the word because I didn't know what legitimacy meant. And you can't measure something until you have an idea of the concept. So I'm only beginning to see the light of what the concept might be. And I may be rediscovering the wheels that many people have discovered before, but I'm doing it through a series of empirical researches about trustworthiness and where I can't explain something by trustworthiness, but something else is going on and I'm beginning to see that shape as legitimacy. So I can't answer your second question. I think we can measure trustworthiness as I suggested. I think we can have various kinds of measures of whether people trust or not something or another. But so far, I don't know the measures of legitimacy. Just beginning to see them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both. Uh, Margaret, can you, can you stay with us uh, 15 more minutes? Uh, sure. 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 Excellent. So I will ask Teresa, Hillary, and then Suzanne to come up. And maybe Ishik uh, for a second time. It depends uh, how it goes. So, uh, Teresa? Ishik knows yeah. how to find me. She can always ask me a question later if she wants to. <laughs> Teresa? Hi. Um, thank you for the fascinating talk. I um, really enjoyed it. Um, 
Um, I had the question, or not, not really a question um, as such, but um, we've touched upon the issue in a discussion before, um, what is trustworthiness and what is perceived trustworthiness. Um, and I think with online media, let's say, especially regarding elections where we have Facebook playing a quite central role sometimes, I think, um, the perception of trustworthiness really changes and um, in terms of well, the voters, um, but also it gives some, um, say the government or any other person really the opportunity to kind of um, present themselves in a way that might be trustworthy, meaning that they might not actually be trustworthy as such if we met them in person, but in fact, the way how they present themselves makes them look trustworthy. Right. And I think that really opposes, like, really presents an issue that we might want to um, grapple with in trust research, at least in the future, as those media are on the rise and as we see, they have quite large effects on, on important. Well, I think there are two process. issues you're raising, Teresa. Both of them very important ones. Uh, let me start with the second one and then go to the media itself. But I want to start with uh, actually. Uh, people presenting themselves as trustworthy and us trusting them. It's one of the reasons that I like to focus on trustworthiness and not on trust. Um, because trust, you know, sometimes our judgments are wrong. We misperceive what is going on and we get conned. So I'm really interested in what causes that misperception, but not in the, I mean, I don't, I don't, see trust as a virtue. I don't see trust as the determinant of anything. I ultimately want to make our institutions more trustworthy and then figure out how to get people to perceive that they are and act on that. And that goes with for the media too. I think the same issue is there for the media. We're now dealing with a whole set of new technologies which are, which are creating all kinds of new problems at several levels of what I was talking about. Um, one, they are contributing to that disparity between uh, the reality of the world and the actuality, you know, and what they think is going on, because um, there are all kinds of echo chambers that reinforce uh, problematic beliefs, in my view, about what's really happening and what's going on. And we don't yet know how to handle that. I mean, there are all kinds of experiments going on um, in some of the big technology companies. Some of the, there's a lot of great research going on. I'm on the board of a, a journal that PNAS, which is dealing with a lot of articles coming in, trying to figure out uh, strategies for in changing that, uh, that distance. Uh, and that misperception and understanding how the misperceptions are created. So I think there's a lot, I think that's a really important area for trust researchers to go into because I think it's a really big, we need to solve that problem. We need to understand the problem and what's really happening in that domain and we need to solve it. Thank you, Hillary, are you with us? Is that responsive? Sorry. Uh, yes. Okay, yes, good. I Hello, Margaret. Uh, thank you. My name is Hilary Sutcliffe. I run a not-for-profit in the UK, and we've been looking for the last year or so on trust and tech governance. So quite narrow, and your work's included in our report that's coming up soon. I um, wanted to ask you a question. Of, we concluded, as you do, that actually being trustworthy, providing evidence of trustworthiness, let's just start there, you know. Um, and we've come to the conclusion that what we've found as drivers of trust that are competence and good intent, but also we're looking at what we're calling values drivers of trust, which is integrity, openness, fairness, inclusion, and just the, that sort of, um, there are things that trustworthy people do. And there are things that, you know, as we found with both of our, you know, countries in terms of elections and COVID response, when trustworthiness is not there, you know, I'm ticking them off. I'm ticking them off every single time I open the newspaper. And you talked about these collective values. Now, I don't see this as values as such, but I see them as we're calling them trust drivers. Do you think there are a sort of a fairly finite number of those that we can look at? 
Yes, I think there are. And I, I, that's part of what I've been trying to drive at in thinking about what constitutes trustworthiness. Um, and I'm not so much looking at what constitutes a trustworthy individual as what constitutes a trustworthy organization or government agency or government itself. Um, so I do think that the, the trust drivers are many of the things that you just uh, listed. Um, integrity is the one that you know seems more of an individual attribute than um, but certainly the fact that uh, if an agency isn't honest in some way, I mean, if it's corrupt or fraudulent in some sense, um, that's, a, that's a sign of integrity in an institutional domain. So yes, I agree. We're putting impartiality and, and some of the accountability things in the integrity box, but it's, as you say, you've got to squish them somewhere. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, good, good effort. I would look forward to seeing the report. I'd love to send it you. <laughs> Please. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Suzanne, technology again. Please. Suzanne. Um, so maybe I ask her a question. Yeah, maybe I, I will ask her a question. She, I, I think the question was, uh, what is the uh, impact of new technologies on uh, trust and and legitimacy of government. Does it change uh, the setting? Does it change uh, only the setting or create a new um, environment uh, for trust and legitimacy? I think I'm representing your question. I don't, well, I partially answered some of that question in, in responding to Teresa. Um, as you know, David, um, I've been looking at questions of trust and trustworthiness in a sense, historically. So I've been going back, I mean, my first um, of rule and revenue looks from ancient Rome to more or less contemporary Australia. And I've looked at 200 years of history in consent, dissent and patriotism. And in other cases, looked at other historical examples. So my model is really trying to draw on a fairly, um, I mean, nothing's totally universal. As I said, the standards change. The, what, what is the content of the standards change? So there's, there are always some things that are at play. And I think that's the same thing with the new technologies. I don't think that changes the world in that sense. I think it's just that we have to accommodate the kinds of pressures that technology creates on citizens' perceptions and what and the kinds of agencies that we need um, to regulate various kinds of technologies. So we have to think about um, new things that we need to make trustworthy, but that doesn't change the fundamental conceptualization of the problem. And yeah, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Let me just ask, um, um, did I uh, miss someone who wants to ask the last question? Uh, please come, come, um, come and raise your voice. Feel free to ask the last question. If not, uh, I will let you go to the rest of your uh, busy schedule and I would love to thank you very much for uh, insightful presentation, um, an overview of uh, your uh, contribution over the years, some things that we will take and, uh, uh, and digest uh, uh, for, the, for the coming uh, months. And so thank you very much, uh, Margaret. It was and thank you for having me. This was a great pleasure. And thanks to all of you who asked questions. And um, I'm not hard to find. So if you have further questions or ideas or suggestions, as several of you did, um, I'm always happy to take them on. <laughs> this is a never-ending process, as far as I can tell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret.